deep in the South Pacific, first to see the dawn of a new day, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Zealand is a land of magnificent contrasts. There really is something for everyone. Snow-covered mountains, deep blue lakes offering every water sport imaginable. Native forests with their unusual lush vegetation. Excitement, action, a chance to do something you never thought you would. The colorful, proud culture of the Maori. This is New Zealand. Come and take a look. New Zealand has two major islands conveniently known as the North and South Islands. For this journey through the country, let's start at the top. With a subtropical climate and long stretches of sandy beaches, Cape Ranga is a real favourite with holidaymakers. Between Cape Ranga and Kaitaia is 90 Mile Beach, a long flat stretch of beach with towering sand dunes on one side and the Tasman Sea on the other. The Tipaki stream is carefully negotiated by tour vehicles every day. Let's face it, who can resist a slide down a sand hill? Ninety Mile Beach is in fact only 88 kilometers long, but seems longer to holidaymakers who take time out to travel along it by four-wheel drive or coach tours. The kauri forests of Northland contain some of the largest native trees in New Zealand, which is understandable when you think these trees are over a thousand years old. Kauri would be New Zealand's most prized native timber. Further down the coast is the Bay of Islands, where some of New Zealand's most significant political and economic activities took place. The Treaty of Waitangi, signed in 1840, created a contract between the Māori people and the British inhabitants and gave New Zealand its founding document. Even today, many aspects of New Zealand's law can be traced back to the intent of the treaty. Russell was once a whaling town and is home to New Zealand's oldest church which still bears the musket holes of those early rugged times. Russell became the country's first capital in 1840. Pompalia House, built in 1842, was the home of the first Catholic mission in New Zealand. Russell's come a long way, and today is a popular summer resort, combining old world charm with the fun and excitement of sun, sea and surf. It's a base for game fishing, and a popular anchorage for pleasure craft. Russell, Waitangi and Paihia are all Northland settlements from which to explore the Bay of Islands. Take your pick of boat tours, or hire a boat or yacht yourself and explore the magnificent natural beaches and hideaways the islands possess. The easy atmosphere of the Bay of Islands is very relaxing, especially from the top deck, or even from a dinghy. 
to get a bird's eye view, you could take to the air. Kiwis enjoy the great outdoors and this patch of ocean with its array of unspoiled islands gives them and their visitors a taste of what the outdoors is all about. Inland from Waitangi and the Bay of Islands is Kerikeri, a flourishing fruit-growing district. This is also where New Zealand's oldest European buildings stand. A national landmark, the Stone House, was built in 1832, while next door, Kemp House was established by Samuel Martin as a second mission station in 1821. <coughs> There can't be many places which still have a steam engine passing through the middle of town. But at Kawakawa, this wee beauty is a regular. On to Auckland and New Zealand's largest city. Auckland is big, bold and breathtaking and is home to almost a third of New Zealand's total population. Across the bridge and into downtown Auckland, with its high-rise buildings showing the commercial strength of the city. Auckland is a colourful, busy city. It is not only home to some of the country's largest commercial interests, but also some of New Zealand's best theatres, art galleries and restaurants. Auckland is known as the City of Sails, and it's easy to see why. The city's warm climate makes it a water-sporting paradise with boats and sea craft of all kinds exploring the islands of the Hauraki Gulf. Inland, you'll find One Tree Hill, the site of an ancient Māori fortress and a monument to the Māori people of New Zealand. Auckland's War Memorial Museum is home to many of New Zealand's national historic treasures. On to the New Zealand Pavilion. Having made a major impact at the 1989 International World Expo in Australia, the pavilion was brought home and is now close to Auckland's International Airport. The Hall of Celebration reveals glimpses of New Zealand's heritage and leads on into a real taste of New Zealand a wool shed. Outside, the entertainment never stops. Another popular attraction in Auckland is Kelly Tarleton's Underwater World, recreating the experience of scuba diving off the coast of New Zealand. It's a magical underwater world where only the fish get wet. You certainly won't find any sharks in here. Waitomo Caves is south of Auckland and is one of New Zealand's most well-known natural wonders. Defying nature, the stalactites and stalagmites cling to the ceilings and base of the caves. The glowworm grotto is a galaxy of thousands of pale blue lights. Geologically, New Zealand is very young and active. A fault line running through the centre of the North Island presents itself as a chain of both active and extinct volcanoes. White Island, Mount Edgecombe, Mount Tarawera, Mount Tongariro, Mount Narahoi, Mount Ruapehu and Mount Taranaki all make up a volcanic chain. Lying off the coast of Bay of Plenty, the active volcano of White Island is an eerie, forbidding sight. 150 metres deep, it continuously emits sulphurous gases and steam that can easily be seen from the mainland 50 kilometres away. In the central North Island, the picturesque mountain Ruapehu is also active. The hot, acidic waters of the crater lake sit atop the mighty mountain.
in winter, snow covers Ruapehu, creating two of the most popular ski fields in the North Island. North of Ruapehu, a devastating eruption took place at Mount Tarawera in 1886. The mountain literally blew its top. A chain of nine deep craters ripped across the mountain, burying many settlements, killing 153 people. pink and white terraces, often referred to as the eighth wonder of the world, were buried forever. Today there is little evidence of the destructive elements which caused such devastation. The small Māori village of Te Wairoa has been partially excavated from the mud and ash. of traditional Māori houses, whare, have been unearthed in an effort to reveal the extent of the Mount Tarawera disaster. Lying at the foot of the mountain is Lake Tarawera, just one of the many lakes which make up the Bay of Plenty district of Rotorua. This region is the ancestral home to many of today's Māori descendants. At its heart is Rotorua City, hub of the North Island's Māori culture, geothermal activity and tourism. Rotorua is a magnet for both New Zealand and overseas visitors. They come to enjoy the exciting range of attractions and entertainment the city offers. Rotorua boasts some fine examples of Tudor-style architecture, St. Faith's Church, and the bathhouse and government gardens. Rotorua City is home to 60,000 people. The area has a strong Māori base, which is evident in the culture of the city. As part of the challenge, a fern is placed on the ground, testing the intentions of the visitor. When the fern is accepted, the visitor is welcomed by the tribe in peace.
The pressing of noses, or hongi, is the traditional Māori gesture of friendliness. The Māori culture is rich in song, dance and skills passed from generation to generation. The poi dance. games. The haka or war dance. The hangi is the traditional Māori feast. The food is placed in baskets and cooked in the ground with white-hot rocks for three to four hours, producing delicious, succulent food. Māori carvings are an important part of the culture as seen at the Māori Arts and Craft Institute. Adorning marae buildings, they're carefully and intricately carved, each telling its own story. New Zealand greenstone, or jade, is very rare and precious to the Māori people. When it's carved, it's done so with great care and respect for the stone. On the Marae is a central meeting house known as Whare Runanga. This building is usually dedicated to a great chieftain or ancestor of the tribe. representing the arms, spine and ribs of the ancestor, intricate carvings also depict a complete tribal history. This whare runanga is the focal point of a tribal settlement, often being surrounded by other buildings such as whare, or the pataka or food storehouse. At Whakarewarewa Thermal Reserve, not much has changed since this country's first beginnings. Storming vents continually explode boiling hot geothermal steam and water into the air. Pohutu, New Zealand's highest erupting geyser, often plays to a height of 18 metres, giving a hint of the awesome powers that lie beneath. The thermal activity of the Rotorua region produces sights, sounds and especially smells unlike that anywhere else in the world. South of Rotorua, at Waiatapu Thermal Reserve, the Lady Knox geyser erupts daily.
might relax. Being so close to such potentially explosive natural energy isn't much of a concern, especially as most of these natural attractions have remained unchanged and stable for many years. As you can see, there's a lot to see and do in Rotorua. And the perfect way to recuperate after a day's sightseeing is in a soothing hot pool. The warm alkaline mineral waters provide a welcome natural source of relief for arthritic and muscular disorders. In Rotorua, you'll find both hot and crystal clear cold springs. At Rainbow and Fairy Springs, you'll see thousands of rainbow and brown trout. The springs are a very popular attraction, nestled in their indigenous setting of native bush. You'll also find native birds, including paradise ducks, hide stilts, native wood pigeons or kororu, and the tui. But the star of the springs must certainly be New Zealand's own kiwi. The female's got a longer, more curved beak than the male, and it's quite a bit larger in body size and it's heavier. Part of Rainbow Springs is Rainbow Farm, a fun look at life down on the farm. With the mock sheep auction, onlookers can bid for the penned sheep. With bidding as high as $800 per sheep, it's just as well it's all for fun. <laughs> To get a bird's eye view of Rotorua, its lake and surrounding countryside, try a ride in the gondola up the slopes of Nongataha. It's a magnificent view. And coming down can be just as much fun on the Skyline Luge. Anyone can do it. Rotorua's Aguadome is well known around the world for its entertaining look at New Zealand's most popular inhabitants, the sheep. There are so many more of them than us. The New Zealand wool industry provides over 45% of the world's total demand for coarse wool. Pretty impressive stuff. Visitors have a lot of fun getting to know the sheep. Just outside, the sheepdog trial display 
doesn't always go according to plan. Wellington is the country's capital and seat of government. Parliament buildings and the Beehive stand side by side. Both are striking landmarks. The New Zealand Parliament system is based on the English parliamentary system. Many travellers leave Wellington for the South Island on an inter-island ferry. Travelling across Cook Strait, the journey takes about three hours through some magnificent scenery. Travelling south down the east coast, you'll come to Kaikoura and a total change of landscape. The snow-capped ranges look down on the rugged Kaikoura coast, its fur seal colonies and the sperm whales and other sea species which regularly visit this stretch of coastline. Further south is Christchurch, the main city in the South Island. Christchurch is almost more English than the English. Its beautiful parks, gardens and architecture echo its strong English links. At the heart of Christchurch is Cathedral Square. It has become an open stage for anyone with a soapbox, but both such performers as the Wizard and even a town crier. Avon winds its way through Christchurch, passing close to some of the city's most well-known buildings. Even the schools of Christchurch could step straight out of an old English novel. Christchurch is a wonderful city to stay in and enjoy, and an ideal base from which to explore the rest of the South Island. Like Dunedin, south of Christchurch and steeped in Scottish heritage, Robbie Burns would have been proud, especially with Dunedin's strong academic base. Dunedin's University of Otago was the first of its kind in New Zealand. Today, students still travel from all parts of New Zealand to gain their degrees there. On the outskirts of Dunedin is Larnox Castle, an extravagant folly in true Scottish style. The castle was built in 1886 with no expense spared. Larnox built a 3,000 square foot ballroom for his daughter as a 21st birthday present. Tragically, she died of typhoid just after its completion. No farewell to Dunedin would be complete without a pipe band. Travelling by road from the east coast to the west, you'll drive through native forests over the mountain passes. The Haast Pass links central Otago and Southland to the west coast. The West Coast has a charm and atmosphere all of its own. In the early days, gold mining brought the people flocking to the West Coast. At Shantytown, just south of Greymouth, you can still pan for gold just the way those early pioneers did. In 
fact, you're even guaranteed a small gold strike of your own. A major gold strike in 1864 saw thousands arrive on the west coast looking for that lucky strike. The rush lasted three years, leaving the area scattered with mining relics which are now preserved. Like Shantytown, the way it all was way back then. Some things have changed. Further up the coast from Shantytown are the Pancake Rocks, created from stratified limestone formations and looking just like a stack of pancakes. The Southern Alps form a mountainous backbone along most of the length of the South Island. Mount Cook, Aurangi, towers at 3,764 metres. The Franz Josef and Fox glaciers are a magnificent sight, forming a river of ice which is fed from the Alps. Those glaciers are moving towards the west coast, be it ever so slowly. At the eastern foot of Mount Cook is Lake Pukaki. The lake's turquoise colour is caused by rock flour, finely ground particles of rock held in suspension and carried to the lake. Lake Tekapo is another peaceful setting and home to the Church of the Good Shepherd. Here, with such a reflective setting and sense of peace, tranquility is found. Lakes Pukaki, Tekapo, Oha, all contribute to hydroelectric power generation, ultimately supplying much needed energy to the north. There are many lakes in the South Island, but lakes Hawea and Wanaka would have to be two of the most picturesque. Lake Wanaka attracts thousands of visitors in both winter and summer. Colonial days are alive and well in nearby Arrowtown. The main street boasts authentic colonial shop fronts, giving visitors a taste of early life in New Zealand and the way it used to look.
nearby Lake Hayes carries on the picturesque quality of the region. Queenstown is one of the country's most popular destinations. Nestled at the foot of the Remarkables, it has become an internationally acclaimed alpine resort. The views are magnificent. And so is the shopping. The TSS Ernslaw is a coal-fired steamer and is known as the Lady of the Lake. It is the last of a long line of steamers which once ruled the waters here. The steamer was originally built to transport people, provisions and animals to the local sheep stations around the shores of Lake Wakatipu. Many vantage points around Queenstown can give you views reminiscent of the Swiss Alps. To get the ultimate view, try the gondola. A great way to appreciate the real majesty of the mountain scenery. You can take it slowly, fast, or at breakneck speed at Queenstown. Jet boating Kiwi style. Guaranteed to get your pulse rate up. Or try a real challenge with white water rafting. The rivers and canyons around Queenstown offer it all. But if you're after a challenge to beat them all, four, three, try a spot two, of bungee one. jumping. Yeah. <laughs> An adrenaline pumping dive of 150 feet. The operators go to great lengths to make sure it's safe, but it helps if you're just a little bit crazy. Exhilarating. <laughs> Try it. I recommend it. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the ski fields around Queenstown are some of the best in the southern hemisphere and attract thousands each ski season. They're a favourite of both New Zealanders and internationals with facilities for all grades of skiing. The valleys and hill country around Lake Wakatipu contain large sheep stations. Each year New Zealand exports more than 370,000 tonnes of wool to over 50 countries. 
Three million New Zealanders share the country with tens of millions of sheep. It's just as well we like them so much. The peaceful southern lakes of Manapuri and Te Anau have their own special qualities. The road to famous Milford Sound is dwarfed by mountains. For many years the sounds lay isolated until the Homer Tunnel, taking 10 years to complete, made it through to the Kedar Valley. The mischievous Kias give an appealing welcome to visitors at the entrance to the tunnel. The grandeur of Fiordland's National Park unfolds itself in Milford Sound. The waters are as deep as the mountains are high. Encircled by mountains, Lake Quill is a natural reservoir cascading 700 metres to the valley floor over Sutherland Falls. Mitre Peak, however, is the most famous landmark in Milford Sound. This is New Zealand. A land of contrasts. A land of unique beauty and a land full of people waiting to welcome you to their country, Kiwi country. When greeting a visitor to New Zealand, the Māori will say, no mai, haere mai, Welcome to Aotearoa. We offer you the same welcome to explore with us the heritage of these remarkable people on these islands they discovered so long ago. A whole world of change awaits us as we examine the Maori history, their culture and their traditions.
Hidden by the mists of time since long before man walked on this earth, a remarkable land of unparalleled beauty waited patiently for life in the rich waters of the southern Pacific Ocean. It was here the Maori arrived from Polynesia during the Great Migration, perhaps a thousand years ago. Its violent birth and growing pains had twisted its spine into mountain ranges and peaks that reached high into the skies. And craters, incredible valleys and vast fjords scarred its surface and chopped away at its outline from one end to the other. But as the unending centuries passed, those jagged outlines were clothed and softened with forests of unbelievable beauty and diversity. Though part of the world of Polynesia, it was probably the last habitable land to be discovered there. And those Polynesians who first saw it already knew of some vast islands in the south, provided by one of their earliest ancestors, a demigod called Maui, who had provided most of the things in their world that made it pleasant and habitable. According to legend, this demigod, Maui, roamed the seas searching for places for his people. At times he cast a line for fish with a hook fashioned from part of the jawbone of his grandmother. And the greatest of all the fish he caught was the North Island of New Zealand, still referred to by the Maui as Te Ika a Maui, the fish of Maui. But thousands more years were to pass before the deep blue waters of the South Pacific around New Zealand were parted by the bows of a number of great canoes. They had come from the north, from Rarotonga in the Cook Group, or Tahiti, or Ayate in the Society Islands, following, tradition say, directions to the fish of Maui handed down by the great Polynesian explorer, Kupe. They were remarkable mariners, these Polynesians, with light brown skins, tall, athletic, and with straight or wavy hair. They came as colonists to these southernmost and largest of all South Pacific Islands, the islands called New Zealand by Abel Tasman, a Dutchman and our first European visitor, but still known to the Polynesians as Aotearoa, land of the long bright cloud. As with many points on our coastline, monuments like this mark the sites of the arrival of canoes said to have arrived in the great fleet of the mid 14th century bringing the first of our Polynesian explorers from Hawaii much further north in the Pacific. Their arrival here was the final step in a history of six or seven thousand years of migrations from Southeast Asia in a series of remarkable voyages which saw them touch every spot of land, however remote, throughout the entire South Pacific and provide a colony for every habitable island and atoll. It earned them also the title of Vikings of the Sunrise and an imperishable place in the world of remarkable accomplishments. By the time Europeans arrived in this part of the world, the Polynesians had already occupied an enormous slice of the Pacific, a giant triangle stretching from Hawaii in the north to New Zealand in the south and Rapa Nui, Easter Island, in the east. And what a remarkable land they found here. These islands of New Zealand are not only the largest in the South Pacific, but also the oldest, with a geological history covering millions of years and a degree of tranquility that had allowed its flora and fauna to develop without interruption. The population of the Maori obviously small to begin with, expanded as one generation succeeded another. There might well also have been further migrant arrivals from tropical Polynesia. Pressure on the coastal lands ultimately meant that the more desirable inland areas gradually received their quota of settlers, and within a century or two, permanent and quite large settlements appeared far inland. As these and their populations expanded, a degree of rivalry over the more favoured locations erupted, bringing warfare in its train. To this end, the Māori evolved a system of fortifications, the ruins of which remain today as examples of ingenuity, amazing engineering and prodigious labour. Hilltops everywhere still show, if you look carefully, the remains of the ancient fortifications. 
Behind me is an ancient pass site that was, in the 1860s, adapted to take a European fort. Only the great timber palisading that once formed a protective outer barrier has disappeared with time. The construction of more permanent houses and other buildings within these sites and settlements, and the desire to adorn the more important of them, led inevitably to an upsurge in the art of carving, which is recognized now as perhaps the ultimate indigenous art form of this country, exhibiting a degree of artistry and skill unmatched in the world of Polynesia. It is in many respects the written record of a people who, until the early 19th century, had never been introduced to the art of writing. The distinctive differences in Māori carvings owe much of this to the isolation of the Māori from the rest of Polynesia over a period of centuries, allowing a unique development. There was too an abundance of mighty timber such as the Tōtara and Kauri, providing a perfect medium for the art. There was also an ample supply of greenstone or jade allowing a variety of chisels that proved vastly superior to those of inferior materials common to most other Pacific Islands. Carving in New Zealand, even in pre-European times when most of the work was done with stone chisels, was regarded as an art form that was unique in Polynesia. But it was undoubtedly the introduction of the steel chisel in the late 18th and early 19th century that gave the impetus to carving that has brought it to the peak of perfection we know today. With the newfound equipment, richly carved houses and a multitude of other pieces became relatively common. Yet despite the techniques and materials available now as we approach the 21st century, much of the carver's art still reflects the loved and ancient legends. Among those most qualified to judge, there are some who believe that foremost in the world of Māori artistry was the superb development of their marine technology. With a maritime background second to none, the vast Pacific Ocean beating against their shores and vast inland waterways, it is obvious that water transport was an important part of the Māori life. Not simply as a means of transport, but in the case of vessels like this, a wakatawa or war canoe, as an essential item in their perilous life. Some of these, which were perhaps 30 metres in length and capable of carrying a hundred paddlers, possessed an element of spirituality, of mana and prestige to those who owned or sailed in them. No better boat building skills ever existed and the flawless jointing of giant timbers placed these clearly among the most graceful of all vessels. As with the finest of their houses, the Māori lavished the full extent of the carver's art on these magnificent masters of the waves. Almost every visible area was adorned with ancient and new patterns cut into the exposed timber. Of all the decoration, however, it was perhaps the delicately exquisite yet powerful bow and stern pieces, the tauihu and taurapa, that exhibited those other essential elements of strength and utility. In design, their superb lines seem to reflect a grace that obviously welcomed a union with the waves. Rising high at the stern of one of the war canoes is this magnificent piece, which is referred to as a taurapa. It is easy to see the skill that has gone into this particular carving. Its delicate spirals seem to be so fragile and yet they are reinforced and strengthened by these beautiful ribs which come down to the base. Nowhere in Polynesia have carvings of these dimensions and these artistic skills exhibited better than on the Wakatawa or Wakanu. Some of these vessels remain in our museums. We are fortunate that a revival of interest has seen a new generation of these waka the canoe of the Māori emerge on our oceans, lakes and rivers.
In earlier times, it was often the custom that the possessions of a man when he died, or a woman for that matter, would be interred with the deceased. In the case of a particularly important man or chief who may have owned a canoe, then very often the canoe itself would be cut into two pieces, one end inserted into the ground like this, and used as a memorial to that chief for as long as the canoe piece would last. As with all peoples, there is a perceived need for decoration, and the Māori was a master of this. The people themselves, at least those of rank, evolved a remarkable extension to the art of carving, using their face and body as the medium. It was what we call tattoo, but the term hardly does justice to this art form. To the Māori, it was moko, a craft that was virtually a carving in the flesh. It is difficult to imagine the agony that must have been endured by those subjected to the artist's tiny, scalpel-sharp chisels as they were tapped into the flesh with a mallet, cutting an infinite variety of patterns over the entire face of the men and sometimes over their shoulders, buttocks and occasionally even down to the knee. Moko for women, while just as important, was usually confined to the lips and chin. As the chisels cut into the flesh, a pigment was applied prepared from the collected soot of burnt kauri gum or the resinous heartwood of the kahikatea tree. The blue-black resulting tracery, following the furrows left in the flesh when healed was as sharp and clear in old age as when it was first applied. The art of moko was discouraged by the earliest missionaries and by the mid-19th century the practice for men had virtually ceased but for women, the decoration of lips and chin continued for some well into the first half of this, the 20th century. And there was another development by the Māori here in New Zealand that is believed by many to epitomise the ultimate skill of a handcraft brought about by necessity, reaching a state of superb beauty. Throughout Polynesia, clothing and many other items were manufactured from the bark of the paper mulberry tree and also the palm of the pandanus. But those plants did not flourish in New Zealand and the Maori had to find something to take its place. And he very quickly found that the native flax, Formium tenax, provided all of the necessary items for clothing and many other uses. It was without question the most important non-food plant in this country. The principle of plaiting obviously came to New Zealand with the Maori. For throughout Polynesia, certain techniques and designs were widespread. Baskets and mats could still be produced in their age-old way, but a major change came with the production of garments, something needed to cope with the colder climate. The Māori devised a method of producing a thread from the fibrous content of the flax leaf, which was then used to manufacture cloaks and the like. The superlative system of downward weaving was evolved. The extraction of the fibre, its transformation into a continuous thread, the setting up and ultimate production of a textile represented sometimes many months of tedious work. Although carving seems to be regarded as the ultimate art form amongst the Māori of New Zealand, there is little doubt that weaving was equally remarkable. When you consider that this beautiful garment has been woven entirely from the thread of the native flax, one can appreciate the skill and the long hours that went into the production of such a beautiful garment. When enhanced and decorated with the feathers of the kiwi and other native birds, these garments achieved a beauty rarely matched. Nowhere in Polynesia did the production of such garments reach the heights they did in New Zealand. Not only did they provide the utility and protection so necessary in the harsher climate of this country, but the artistic merit was unsurpassed. When the quality and the beauty of these garments is taken into consideration, it is easy to understand why they have always been amongst the most prized items of the Māori people. And even today, on important occasions, the most prized gift that can be offered to a visitor is one of these beautiful cloaks. Ah, 
These occasions also gave the Māori the opportunity to display other personal treasures, many handed down through successive generations. Ornaments of greenstone or bone in a variety of forms evolved over the centuries, and weapons, many bearing individual names and each, in a way, possessing its own spiritual individuality. Though varying in size and shape, these hand weapons were all clubs in one form or another, and many of these hardwood, whalebone or greenstone pieces have been wielded with destructive force against enemies of the ancestors of those holding them today. <laughs> Tradition demands that visitors of consequence, or groups from afar, are challenged on arrival at a marae or village gathering place. This is, in essence, to determine whether the visit is a friendly one or otherwise. token is offered to the visitor. If it is accepted, they come in peace. Speeches are exchanged, the speakers validating their position in society and explaining their relationship to those assembled, with sometimes monumental genealogies extending back into the mists of time. Even today, these formal Māori functions are conducted in New Zealand's own indigenous language. <laughs> However, all is not formality at a Māori gathering. There are songs and dances that generally portray a past way of life and incidents of note drawn from legend and tradition. The young people, as all young people do, use these gatherings to cement friendships, to pursue the course of love or to join in games that were favourites throughout the land. Their games were little different from what they are anywhere in the world. They are to provide amusement, pleasure, and a degree of competition. There was kite flying, walking on stilts, the skill of whipping a spinning top, tobogganing on a hillside, knuckle bones and cat's cradle, and other amusements. The girls were encouraged to participate with song and dance and to master the use of the poi, a rope or bulrush ball attached to either a long or short string. These actions and skills were held to endow them with a special grace of movement much admired. <laughs> 
Games encouraged for the boys, on the other hand, were generally much more athletic and required particular dexterity. The haka, a posture dance in particular, was designed to fire the enthusiasm as well as discouraging belligerence in a possible aggressor. They were undoubtedly looked upon as initial military exercises to provide for the agility and precision that would be so vital during adulthood. But of all things at a gathering like this, it is the superb Farerunanga, the meeting house that holds pride of place not only for this tribe but for all tribes and sub-tribes throughout New Zealand. It is in fact referred by them to be their poho, the very seat of affection of their people. But it's more than that. It represents in fact the body of the ancestor after whom most of these houses are named. Inside the Farerunanga, or meeting house, lavish use was made of the artists of each tribe and sub-tribe. The carvers were here to provide the magnificent popo, these carved panels, which in turn supported the rafters, likened to the ribs of a man, which in turn supported the main ridge pole or spine. And between the great popo, the women prepared these beautiful panels of tukutuku, which were in fact panels that held the insulation, the rope or bulrush behind the walls. And the decorations were done from pingao, from kie kie, forest products used to make these beautiful designs. <laughs> Although these little houses hardly rate as superior dwellings, they were perfectly adequate for the time. Generally in use where they were cultivating and that sort of thing, they were more than adequate for a family and shelter for the night. And moreover, they were built with absolute protection. The walls were lined closely with the rope or bulrush, which gave them marvelous insulation and built of the of the trunks of the kaponga or mamaku, they lasted almost indefinitely and merely had to be repaired when they were required again. Surely one of the finest of all Māori buildings, and certainly one of the most ornate, was this, the pātaka, or storehouse, where, in the case of a particularly fine example like this, many of the treasures belonging to a particular sub-tribe would have been stored. In the case of less ornate storehouses, they would have been used probably for food, hence they are well up from the ground to prevent uh, any depredations by rats or other rodents. <laughs> And the provision of food, particularly in generous quantities to visitors, has always been an obligation to Maori hosts. In common with most Pacific peoples, food was, in most parts of New Zealand, prepared in earth ovens, where heated rocks sprinkled with water produced sufficient steam to cook to perfection and provide a unique flavour found with no other method.
Those living in the thermal areas, which run like a scar across New Zealand's North Island, were fortunate, and still are, because nature here provides an abundance of steam or boiling water where food can be prepared to perfection, on demand, 24 hours a day. Here, the whole process is a much simpler matter. Even today, this cooking system, known as the hangi, is utilized to the full and particularly appreciated by visitors to our country. The New Zealand Māori population numbered perhaps 200,000 when European colonization began making a distinct impact during the early 19th century. The trickle of European arrivals soon became a flood and there was no way it could be stemmed. The largely inflexible and often inexplicable English system of law at that time, along with the rapid alienation of vast areas of ancestral land, drove many of the original inhabitants to a point of desperation and inevitably to conflict. Twice there was open warfare, once in the far north during the 1840s, when the warrior Honeheke cut down the British flagstaff to show his rejection of their authority. Then again during the 1860s and early 1870s, there was a renewal of hostilities, and during this long, miserable period in our history, confusion, mistrust and misunderstandings eventually found the Māori precipitated not only into battles with the European armies, but also against troops of their own people. As if these things were not enough, the country was rocked in June 1886 by the eruption of Mount Tarawera, leaving a vast chasm across the countryside which still, in many places, seethes and hisses as a reminder of the forces still only held in check by the thin layer of earth beneath our feet. In that one blinding night, the surrounding lands were plastered and buried deep beneath a layer of ash and scalding mud, wiping out the surrounding villages and their inhabitants, burying them forever under a now unrecognizable landscape. Some were a little luckier, and despite the destruction of their land and most of their possessions, they survived. Stark reminders of that fateful night remain at Te Wairua, the buried village. Today the mountain displays a peaceful and picturesque backdrop to the beautiful Lake Tarawera. Before the 20th century arrived, the Māori population, ravaged by war, disease and despondency, had plunged to less than 40,000. Those watching believed that the New Zealand Māori would soon be as extinct as the moa. And even those with sympathy for these people and their plight felt that the only thing to do was to smooth the pillows for their long and final sleep. But they were wrong, and the 20th century has seen a remarkable revival. Intermarriage with white arrivals began to swell their numbers, and today a largely younger population has almost reached 300,000. 
The Māori of today maintains a powerful link with the past, but almost a century and a half have been needed to restore these people to a level of real security, to the position rightfully theirs, where they are able now to involve all New Zealanders in a unique cultural identity found nowhere else. Importantly too, a skillful use of their remaining resources has put them squarely into the worlds of business, education and economics with the obvious promise of a full share in all that technology will provide in the 21st century. But sharing is not limited to technology, and the road to equality for the Māori has not been an easy one. There is hope now, however, and in all levels of government service and in the halls of power, Parliament itself, the Māori is making a significant contribution towards that ultimate goal. Education for both Māori and non-Māori provides opportunity for all ages to learn Māori language and culture. And indeed, such studies are now an established part of school curriculum. As part of the revival of the Māori language, kohanga reo, language nests, give our little ones the chance to absorb and appreciate the tongue of the Māori. The whole history of New Zealand's Polynesians, the Māori, has been one of challenge. But there is a new air of optimism for the survival. In fact, not only for the survival, but for the promotion and the acceptance of their rich culture as a national heritage. We are fortunate too for the strength that must ultimately come from an amalgam of the rich and diverse cultures on these beautiful islands. Deep in the South Pacific, New Zealand is comprised of two main islands. At the northern tip of the South Island, and covering just over 22,000 hectares, is New Zealand's smallest national reserve, the Abel Tasman National Park. Taking between three and five days to walk, the Abel Tasman Coastal Track has become one of New Zealand's most popular tracks. Being a coastal track has its advantages. Launch transport can provide drop-off or pick-up services from virtually any beach or bay along the coast. For the casual tramper, 
the New Zealand Department of Conservation has established four main huts and camping areas throughout the park. As an alternative option to the huts, private concerns such as Abel Tasman National Park Enterprises provide fully guided walks and lodge style accommodation at both Awaroa and Torrent Bay. The southernmost end of the track is located at Maraho. Trampers need to be reasonably well equipped with food for three to four days as well as warm clothing and wet weather gear just in case. I mean, they've got serious doubts about us ever getting past the coffee house here, I think. Those wishing to start at the northern end of the track, at Tōtaranui, coastal transportation can be boarded south of Marahau at the beautiful seaside town of Kaiteriteri. Many coastal transport services operate from Kaiteriteri with launches such as the Abel Tasman Explorer servicing the coast with regular day trips. A pleasant three-hour launch cruise travelling north from Kaiteriteri calls into a number of bays many of which can be identified by unique coastal formations such as Split Apple Rock located just offshore at Towers Bay. The coastal outcrops of granite rock also provide an interesting spectacle. Being eroded by hundreds of years of wind and waves, the granite cliffs of Arch Point are slowly breaking down, forming small tunnels and arches. Tonga Island is the sanctuary for a colony of fur seals. The island is only a few hundred meters from the mainland with the rich waters surrounding the island providing a plentiful source of food for these most welcome visitors. Tides can be extreme along this coast, with rise and falls of up to four meters per tide being typical. During low tides, anchorage in the deeper offshore waters is necessary with smaller passenger boats providing a shuttle service to and from the launch. Launch crews along the coast can give time for passengers to relax and enjoy not only the many sights, but also the climate of one of New Zealand's most sunny regions. Starting the walk at Tōtaranui is very popular However, the third option of beginning the walk around the western side of Separation Point at Wainui Inlet effectively adds about four hours to the first leg of the walk, which ends at Awaroa. The Wainui option starts with a coach journey from Motueka or Takaka, arriving at the inlet around mid-morning. The walk from Wainui winds its way up Gibbs Hill, giving excellent views of Golden Bay farewell spit to the west. After the initial climb, a gently ambling track over Separation Point opens up to one of the longest golden sand bays in the park at Tōtaranui. 
Abel Tasman was the first European to sight this coast in 1642. Settlement here at Tōtaranui began in 1856. The beach is almost two kilometers long. Clay minerals have colored the sand of this bay with reddish golden hues, very much in contrast to the brilliant white sands of nearby Awaroa. No matter what your age, the track itself is very easy to walk. The gentle climbs and descents weave in and out of the coast, often opening up to spectacular views of sunny bays and clear blue waters. For those guided walks through the park, ample opportunities to stop and more closely examine the flora are everywhere. This is the uh, forest cabbage tree, which um, frequents the, uh, the, the, the rainforest, the temperate rainforest that we have here. It flowers in springtime too, you can actually see the remainder of the, of the flowering head here. And that has a very pungent smell, it's a beautiful smell, which, which really sort of just flows through the forest, it's wonderful. <laughs> Appearing from nowhere and laced by gently rolling surf and golden sands, stretches of paradise unexpectedly present themselves. Remote, alone. Awaroa Estuary is the largest tidal inlet in the park. This is the only place along the track where there is no alternative to using the tidal route and can only be negotiated two hours before and after low tide. However, for those on guided walks, there is no concern about tidal crossings as the lodge boat can transport small groups across the estuary. The homestead lodge, Awaroa, is built on the original site of the Hadfield homestead and is today operated by a family business, Abel Tasman National Park Enterprises. As part of three to five day guided walks, the oasis of this lodge is a welcome sight, especially after the two to three hour walk from Tōtaranui. The Wilson family has been associated with the park for over a hundred years. In the late 1800s, the original homestead was established but fell into disrepair over the years. Closely resembling the old building, the homestead lodge has been completely rebuilt and now caters for up to 20 guests at a time. Much care has been taken into giving the lodge the authentic feeling of the old world, yet with the luxury of modern day comforts. There's even a resident cook. around the open fire at the lodge can be very enjoyable and very much in contrast to the accommodation provided for the casual tramper. Further inland from the lodge is the Awaroa hut and camping ground. New Zealand's Department of Conservation has provided excellent facilities here with bunk rooms and ample outside campsites. Maggi tomato noodles and yeah, instant noodles. Instant noodles. <laughs> the stand of the, of the huts is pretty good, and if you don't pack too much food, you can survive, even though you're not incredibly fit. <laughs> and the walk's not too difficult either. <laughs> day at Awaroa brings forth the anticipation of taking time out to explore the estuary. 
For an hour or two, either side of low tide, the sea is shut out by a large sandspit. The ground is firm and the streams unhurried, never being more than knee deep. Being based at either the hut or at the homestead lodge, bush-clad sites always tend to present an inescapable presence of the more permanent inhabitants of the forest. Basically into the can out there. <laughs> Ten minutes later, my mother went out, and we all heard was this really horrendous screams. We rushed out there, and seriously, it was like a thousand wetters had crawled out from every yeah. point in this long drop. Big ones like this, bigger than that. Sandbanks, mud flats and clear, shallow, winding streams of the estuary open up pathways to some fascinating natural and historical sites. Estuaries are unusual places. Not quite valleys, not quite beaches, not quite swamps, but they are extremely important ecologically. They have a very high level of productivity and supply food chains which attract many varieties of fish, animals, birds and plants. Life in an estuary is constantly on the move, as too are the surrounding landforms. Sand and silt from the hills form small pockets of land, here one day and gone the next, while wind, rain and tide slowly devour larger landforms. It's hard to believe, but deep within the bush of Awaroa is a popular reflection of modern day life. Ah, fresh water. <laughs> An enterprising lifestyle bush pub and restaurant is to be found, complete with meals, drinks, and a thoroughly Kiwi atmosphere. Went for a swim, beautiful. Wonderful, I had a few shells. Highly recommendable. Look at this. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> Can you take them back home? Yeah, I hope so. Mm -hmm. If you get them through heavy. customs, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well here we are on day three. We're going to do our longest tramp of, the, of our adventure. We're going to go over to Tonga, over the hill there. And from Tonga we'll uh, take a five minute break and then head over to Tonga Quarry where we'll have some lunch. Walking from Awaroa to Torrent Bay and Anchorage takes approximately six hours through some beautiful forest walks and remote beaches. Moving inland over the Tonga Saddle, the track to Torrent Bay skirts a swampy wetland area, home to raupo, flax and the adaptable manuka tree, eventually opening up to the beautiful sweeping sands of Onetahuti Beach. 
Onetahuti is sometimes referred to as Big Tonga. A feature of this beach is the way the stream from the southern end prefers to run the length of the bay between swamp and beach dunes, eventually merging with the Richardson stream at the northern end of the bay. The shoreline of this relatively shallow bay is often deserted, but only the rhythmic sound of the waves breaking the peace of solitude. If you look across the way there, you can see there's Tonga Island, and that has a seal colony on, on the other side. It's a nice track, quite easy to walk, very easy to walk. Just walking along the track and you come to a bay, it's just the amazing views of the uh, islands and the sea. The highlight so far, I think, is uh, days like today and walking on golden beaches like this, you know. Um, it's just beautiful. Yeah. Well, it's clean, there's nothing, uh, nothing washed up here. Unlike Europe, if you go to a beach in Europe, there's always a bit of plastic floating around, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Walking down the beach and into the bush at the southern end takes trampers from One Tahuti to Tonga Quarry. This portion of the track takes about 20 minutes to negotiate. Tonga Quarry is a miniature version of One Tahuti. Building grade granite stone was once quarried from the site, with a few abandoned square blocks now being the only evidence of a once thriving enterprise. And uh, the remnants are all lying all over the place. This is all granite rock here. You can see these, these small indentations here where they put the gel ignite the explosives and, and they break it down the um, break it down the faults the natural faults in the rock so you'd end up with um, you know the, the natural faults splitting apart unspoilt yeah. come on in like a nice quiet beach and there's like not hordes of people around it. the official camping area of this lovely little bay is also perfect for a night stopover. Well, I'm making a vegetable soup with all kinds of stuff which we have left over because tomorrow we finish our track. So today I used all the vegetables. Although there is a bit of a climb at the beginning, the long walk from Tonga Quarry to Bark Bay follows an easy undulating line along the side of Long Valley. The beautiful sandy spit of Bark Bay is very popular with many cruise passengers. Catching the launch at Kai Tiri Tiri in the morning allows for an early drop-off here, with ample time for exploration and lunch before the launch returns around mid-afternoon. The Department of Conservation has established a hut at Bark Bay, well positioned behind the sandy spit, near to the small tidal lagoon. This hut is an ideal base to stay for a night, to allow for exploration of the many surrounding features, such as Falls River and Sandfly Point. Well, the hut books are in there to be written in. Yeah, we need to know um, where they are, if they're due out, when they're due out, if families might be wondering where they are. It just makes, us easy, makes yeah. it easier for us to track them down. Walking from Bark Bay to Torrent Bay takes about two to three hours through some magnificent forest. And for those with a keen eye, the many oh, forest okay, creatures can offer a fascinating yeah, source of interest. The clothes on. Good examples of New Zealand's beach forest line the track, with rimu, kamahi, cedar and kahikatea trees, as well as the rata, providing lush tundra.
tunnels of vegetation. A highlight of the walk to Torrent Bay is the Falls River Swing Bridge. Steep banks of lush native flora rise from the river floor, carefully concealing the onward going track. A 20 minute hike upstream reveals the actual falls, while downstream the river opens up to Sandfly Point and then eventually to the sea. South of Sandfly Point is Frenchman Bay, a very sheltered, privately owned seaward beach, home to what would have to be one of New Zealand's most exclusive holiday homes. Following the track south, a small climb inland reveals the abundant sands and estuary of Torrent Bay. This is one of the few bays which is not actually designated as part of the park, allowing for the sighting of holiday batches and the Torrent Bay Lodge, owned and operated by Abel Tasman National Park Enterprises. Fully guided walks usually stop here for two nights, allowing a full day to be used for sea kayaking, bush walks, or just lazing around and taking in the beautiful surroundings. Torrent Bay Lodge is well equipped. All the modern comforts are here. Well appointed seaside rooms complement the very relaxed, homely atmosphere of the lodge. After a long day's walk, the anticipation of an evening meal, which has been cooked on a genuine coal range, is definitely very appealing. For dinner tonight, we have chicken with cashew nuts and then chocolate cake with chocolate sauce. <laughs> this is a time to share the day's experiences, enjoy a hearty meal, and to discuss what lies ahead. The beautiful dawn of the eastern sky brings forth a new day. Just off the shores of Torrent Bay is Ballon Island. With the use of a sea kayak, this and many other features within the estuary can be explored. These specially designed craft provide a pleasant change to the walking track and can give a very different perspective of the park. The popularity of using sea kayaks to traverse the coastline is evident by the number of kayaking tours operating throughout the park. With some expert tuition and a little practice, it doesn't take too long to master these agile craft. A whole new world opens up from this coastal perspective. There's even the added bonus of receiving a bit of exercise for the arms rather than the legs while exploring the many bays, coves, islands that regularly present themselves. Here we are, this is day four and we're going to go for a bit of a wander around the lagoon and go up to Cleopatra's Pool, check that out for a while and uh, then head over to Tipukatiya Bay via Anchorage and see the 
the park hut there. Torrent Bay Estuary is considerably smaller than Awaroa. Low tide opens up easy access to some of the park's best examples of native bush okay, and wildlife. Got here the, the beech tree, a very common tree in the New Zealand forest. And uh, a question that's often asked me is, has there been a fire through here? But it's not actually, it's, this is a fungus that'll grow, that's growing on the outside of the beech tree. And it's living in a symbiotic relationship with an insect that lives right inside and, and feeds on the sap. And these little hairs come out here are actually, the, um, they, they, they're getting rid of the waste product of this little scalene insect called the honeydew. And that's, that's, that's basically used sap coming out of there. And that's fed on by many of the, many of the um, insects in the New Zealand forest, particularly the wasps and the bees now, of course. But um, the bellbirds and the tuis also feed on the, on the honeydew. The seaweed droplets on the end there. So this is a, the tree actually really relies on it as well. So when you get a rainstorm, you'll get the water running down the trunk and washing the sweetness off, which is actually used sap as I say, into the ground here. It'll wash off some of the fungus, as you can see the fungus is on the ground here. But the, the, uh, the tree will actually feed on, on what has washed off its own trunk and then give it back into the tree again. So the whole thing becomes quite a as they call a symbiotic relationship. That means that they, they all rely on each other. The fungus, the scalene insect, the, the honeydew, and the beech tree. It's a very important part of the New Zealand, New Zealand southern beech forests. It's the honeydew. Beech trees thrive within this environment. Many long sunny days are only occasionally broken by the relatively low rainfall of this region, which fills the streams and nourish the many ferns and other flora of this subtropical forest. Okay, just looking here at the uh, the Maumaku, which is the giant, giant tree fern which will grow up to about 17 metres tall. It's characterised by the uh, very black fronds. And if you look up just behind that one, you can see there's one that's uh, not so healthy. And the story behind the silver ferns is that the Māori people used to lay them along the tracks upside down to be able to see the tracks that they were on. They, had, they were slightly luminous. Just in front of us here we have, have uh, rata vines going up this, this tree here, joined, look, joined up right at the top. A lot of these in the beginning would have, would have been the, uh, the seedling up in the crook of the tree would have germinated and, and would have come down to meet the ground. As you see, they're all basically rooted into the ground and they're quite strong, as you can see. Yeehaw. Yeehaw. This plant we have in front of us with this uh, wonderful purple colour is, is what we call the Dianella. And that sort of comes out about this time of year and about autumn time. The uh, the use that the Māori people used to have for, that, for this, well it is said, we're not 100% sure of course with oral history and so on, but they used to use these berries with this dark colour to, for, for the uh, tattoos of their mukus on their, on, their, on their chins and so on. And uh, hence the, the Europeans have a name for this same plant and it's called the inkberry for obvious reasons. The track to Cleopatra's pool takes about one hour from the Torrent Bay Lodge. Carved out from a massive chunk of bedrock, a freshwater swimming hole has been formed. Well, here we are at Cleopatra's Pool. We've got uh, the very characteristic river style of uh, the Abel Tasman with the granite rock everywhere. Large granite boulders being washed down very slowly by the river. To look at uh, the rock formation just in front of the waterfall there, you've got Cleopatra lying on her side with the waterfall just to the right of the waterfall you have her shoulder coming down to her legs at the right where the water flows out. Behind Cleopatra as the water flows down is actually a natural hydroslide. There are a total of four tracks around Torrent Bay. Two leading to the sea, 
and two leading to the inland forests. Low tide allows quick and direct access to these tracks, with ambling estuary waters being only a formality to cross. Beautiful white sands highlight one of the Abel Tasman's most photographed and sheltered bays. Anchorage Bay is just over a hill from Torrent Bay and could easily be mistaken as a remote island beach more commonly found within the tropics. The early writings of Frenchman and explorer Dumont d'Urville described Anchorage as a pretty basin promising a most peaceful and convenient harbour for small ships. Today, little has changed since the early explorations of Deville. I had very high expectations before I came, and most of them have been met. I've heard a lot about it. At the northern end of the bay, a small rocky outcrop shelters another well-shaped feature similar to that of Cleopatra's pool. Only this time, with a little creative vision, the outline of a small elephant comes to life. At the opposite end of the bay, a small area of bush has been cleared, making way for the anchorage hut and official camping area. This hut is similar in size to most of the official huts throughout the park, with ample room to either bunk down or camp for the night. The final portion of the track south from Anchorage to Maraho takes about six hours. It is after this that the complete satisfaction of knowing you have walked one of New Zealand's most loved national parks will come upon you. A park which will remain as a precious memory for many years to come. Park for all seasons, the Abel Tasman National Park. <laughs>